Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Euclidean domains. Okay, so, in this video what we're going to now do is have a look at the first important property of Euclidean domains. And that first important property is that all ideals in a Euclidean domain are principal ideals. Okay, so let's now prove this. So, uh, we'll call our Euclidean domain still capital D. Okay, so let's say we now have some ideal within our Euclidean domain, capital D. And remember, Euclidean domain, after all, is just a commutative ring, okay? So we can still easily talk about ideals in there, okay? And it just means exactly what it did before. We've just got added structure on here that we know is true, which is the Euclidean size function, and we've also got the integral domain property, but we can still apply all of the old stuff uh, concerning commutative rings, okay? So let's say we've got some ideal, capital I, which is an ideal of our Euclidean domain, capital D. What I now want to prove is that this is a principal ideal. All ideals within an Euclidean domain are principal ideals. So I want to prove that there exists, let's say, what should I call it, uh, some little a, which is an element of the domain capital D, okay, the Euclidean domain, uh, such that if I generate the principal ideal from a, that is actually equal to the ideal capital I. So I want to prove that there's some element within the Euclidean domain, and of course it will actually be in the ideal, okay, uh, that generates the entire ideal when we consider its principal ideal. Okay, and that would then prove that the ideal was a principal ideal. Okay, so how are we going to do this then? Uh, well, if you've seen, uh, and you should have seen, uh, the proof that all the ideals in the integers are principal ideals. We're going to follow basically the exact same strategy there. We're just now going to generalize it. Okay, we're going to apply it to an arbitrary Euclidean domain. Okay, so the first step we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, this ideal, capital I, it contains a whole bunch of elements from our Euclidean domain, capital D. Okay, I want you to go through that ideal and find me an element that has the smallest possible Euclidean size function. Okay, so this ideal contains loads of elements. All of those elements uh, will have, except of course the additive identity, will have uh, Euclidean sizes. Okay, so the Euclidean size function on the Euclidean domain will ascribe them all sizes, except the additive identity. Don't bother doing it for the additive identity. Okay, of the ones that do have Euclidean sizes, look for one that has the smallest value in your ideal. There must be a smallest Euclidean size function uh, value on your ideal, okay? There must be some element that has the smallest value. Now, of course, there might be loads of elements in the ideal that all have the same uh, Euclidean size value, and that, that might be the smallest one, and they all might have that same one, okay? So there might be degeneracies here. Just pick one of them, okay? So let's say A here, which is the element of the ideal, has the smallest Euclidean size function, okay? So F of A is the smallest it can possibly be. So for all other elements of the ideal, okay, so I can write this like so, for all, let's say, B is an element of the ideal, it must be the case that F of B, the Euclidean size function uh, ascribed to B, must be greater than or equal to the Euclidean size function ascribed to A. So we pick some A such that this is true, basically, such that the Euclidean size ascribed to all the other elements of the ideal is either greater than or equal to the Euclidean size ascribed to A. Okay, now I claim that we can use A here to generate the entire ideal. Okay, so I claim, this, this is still to be shown, to show, okay, that if we generate the principal ideal generated by A, this is equal to the entire ideal, capital I. Okay, so how are we going to show that? Uh, well, firstly, what I want to show is that all of the principal ideal generated by A here must be contained within the ideal, capital I. And then what I want to show is that there can't be any other element outside of the principal ideal generated by A, which is in this ideal, capital I. And we will show that by a proof by contradiction, and we'll be able to to prove that if there was such an element that was outside of the principal ideal generated by A in the ideal capital I, that it would contradict um, this statement here that f of A is the smallest value in the ideal capital I. Okay, so let's do this. So firstly what I want to show 
So number one to prove is that the entire principal ideal generated by A is contained within the ideal capital I. Well, that's absolutely simple, okay? If A is an element of the ideal, which of course we initially stated it was, uh, then all multiples of A by elements of the Euclidean domain capital D have to be within the ideal, and all of those elements are in the principal ideal generated by A. So indeed, all of the elements of the principal ideal generated by A must be in the ideal capital I. Now, the slightly less trivial thing to prove is that there's nothing else, okay? There's no other element um, in the ideal that isn't in there. Okay, so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to do it by proof by contradiction. Okay, so what I'm going to suppose is that there is some other element in the ideal that isn't in the principal ideal generated by A, and I'm just wondering which notation to use. I might use alpha, okay? I might go Greek. Okay, so let's say alpha is an element of the ideal capital I, uh, and alpha is not an element of the principal ideal generated by A. Okay, so we're assuming the exact opposite of what we want to prove now. We're assuming there is some element in the ideal capital I that is not in there. Okay, and we're now going to arrive at a contradiction. So that's the exact opposite of what we want to prove. Remember, we want to prove that all elements in the ideal are also in the principal ideal generated by A, and therefore we'd have shown that the ideal is contained within the principal ideal generated by A, and therefore we'd have shown that the two were equal to one another. Okay, right. So, if we assume this, I'm going to show that we can contradict this being true. Okay, so because our Euclidean domain, capital D, is indeed Euclidean, what we can do now is we can write alpha as a multiple... Uh, sorry, we can write alpha as some multiple of A plus a remainder. Okay, so because it's a Euclidean domain, what we can do is write alpha is equal to Q times A... Uh, plus a remainder. And I should stress, of course, that A was not equal to the zero element. We assumed that A was not equal to the zero element. And of course, really, I should have split this into cases. There is, of course, the case that we're dealing with the zero ideal, in which case the only element in the ideal is zero. For all the other ideals, there is an element that isn't zero. And of course, we picked that when we were picking A because we wanted the element with the smallest possible Euclidean size function, and the zero element doesn't even have a Euclidean size function. So I should have stressed that probably earlier on, that we can't do this if we're working with the zero ideal. But for all the other ideals, this applies perfectly well. And A would not have equal zero, so we are perfectly allowed to do this. Okay, so alpha will be writable as some multiple of A, Q times A here, plus a remainder. And remember, this remainder must either equal zero, so R must either equal zero, or uh, the Euclidean size function of R must be strictly less than the Euclidean size function of A here. Okay, and you might be starting to see where this is going. Okay, now R is not going to equal zero. Okay, and the reason is that if r was equal to 0, then alpha would be a multiple of a, and therefore alpha would be in the principal ideal generated by uh, a. So we can instantly rule that one out. Okay, so then we get the possibility that we will write alpha as some multiple of a here, some q times a, plus a remainder where the Euclidean size function uh, acting on the remainder gives a value that is strictly less than the Euclidean size of a. Okay, now why is that a problem? Well, I claim that R is going to be in the ideal capital I, and that would then contradict uh, this statement here, that all elements of the ideal have a Euclidean size that is greater than or equal to the Euclidean size of A, because now we've found one that has a Euclidean size strictly less than the Euclidean size of A. Okay? So, uh, how can I conclude that R is an element of the ideal? Well, the reason is that we can rewrite R as alpha plus the additive inverse of Q times A. Now, alpha was assumed to be an element of the ideal. A was an element of the ideal, so Q times A was an element of the ideal. Because it's an additive subgroup, its additive inverse would have been in there, so negative Q times A uh, would have been in uh, the ideal, and therefore we're adding two elements of the ideal together again because it's an additive subgroup that will still be in the ideal. So we can now say that R has to be in the ideal, and therefore we've reached a contradiction because we found an element in the ideal which has Euclidean size less than the Euclidean size of A. So now I've proven that when you chose that A, you did a 
awful job. Okay, you gave me the wrong value. You did not give me the A which had the smallest Euclidean size in the ideal. Okay, so if it was the case that the principal ideal generated by A wasn't equal to the entire ideal capital I, um, then you can prove that that A that you had wasn't the element with the smallest size in the uh, ideal, basically. Okay, so now what this proves is that this cannot have been the case, and therefore all elements of the ideal must have been in the principal ideal generated by A. So if this wasn't true, it implies that this was true, and therefore we can conclude, given this and this, that the principal ideal generated by A is equal to the entire ideal capital I. Okay, so to just repeat that argument, um, I will again initially go over my initial mistake. Remember, I forgot to divide this into two cases. The ideal here could be the zero ideal, in which case it wouldn't be possible to do this. Okay, but the zero ideal is a principal ideal generated by zero, of course, so it's trivial for the zero ideal. For all the other ideals, you will have an element in them that is not equal to zero, and therefore you'll be able to find an element which has the smallest possible Euclidean size. Okay? Uh, then what you can do is claim that uh, that element of the smallest possible Euclidean size, it will generate a principal ideal which will actually be equal to the ideal capital I, and the way that you can prove that is with this proof here. Okay, firstly you can easily state that all the elements of the principal ideal generated by that element have to be contained within the ideal, and then what you can prove is that uh, you can't have any other elements in the ideal that are not in the principal ideal generated by A, because if one did exist, you'd be able to prove that you did an awful job when you selected A, that there was some element in the ideal which had a smaller Euclidean size than that value A. Okay, uh, so that would be a contradiction. So you have to therefore assume that there were no such elements and therefore that the entire ideal was contained within the principal ideal generated by A and therefore given these two statements that the two are equal to one another. So what we now have succeeded in doing is showing that if you have any ideal within um, your Euclidean domain Either that will be the zero ideal, which is a principal ideal, or it will be um, a principal ideal and it will be generated by the element in it that has smallest Euclidean size. Okay, and I'll stress that you could have multiple elements that have that smallest Euclidean size and they'd all successfully generate the same ideal if you took their principal ideals. Okay, right, uh, so we'll have a break there, and in the next video what we'll talk about is greatest common divisors in a Euclidean domain and the Euclidean algorithm.